Welcome to theCUBE's continuing coverage of AMD's fourth generation EPIC launch. I'm Dave Nicholson and I'm joining you here in our Palo Alto studios. We have two very interesting guests to dive into some of the announcements that have been made and maybe take a look at this from an AI and ML perspective. Our first guest is Milind Domley. He's a senior director for software and solutions at AMD. Uh, and we're also joined by Seamus Jones, who's the Director of Server Engineering at Dell Technologies. Welcome, gentlemen, how are you? I'm very well, good, thank you. Welcome to theCUBE. So let's start out really quickly. Seamus, uh, what, give us a thumbnail sketch of what you do at Dell. Yeah, so um, I'm the Director of Technical Marketing Engineering here at Dell. And uh, our team really takes a look at the technical server portfolio and solutions and ensures that we can look at you know the performance metrics uh, benchmarks and uh, performance characteristics so that way we can give customers a good idea of what they can expect from the server portfolio when they're looking to buy power edge from dell milland how about you what's what's new at amd what do you do there great to be here thank you for having me at amd i'm the senior director of performance engineering and isv ecosystem enablement which is a long winded way of saying we do a lot of benchmarks, improve performance, and demonstrate with wonderful partners such as Seamus and Dell, the combined leverage that AMD fourth generation processors and Dell systems can bring to bear on a multitude of applications across the industry spectrum. Seamus, talk about that relationship a little bit more, the relationship between AMD and Dell. How far back does it go? Uh, what does it look like in practical terms? Absolutely. So, you know, Ever since AMD re-entered the server space, uh, we've had a very uh, close relationship. Um, you know, it's one of those things where we are offering uh, solutions that are out there to the, our customers, no matter what generation of portfolio, if they're if they're demanding um, either from their competitor or AMD, uh, we offer portfolio solutions that are out there. Um, what we're finding is that within their generational improvements, uh, they're just getting better and better and better. Really exciting things happening from AMD at the moment. Um, and we're seeing that as we engineer those CPU stacks into our, our uh, server portfolio, you know, we're really seeing unprecedented performance across the board. So excited about uh, the, the history. You know, my team and Malin's team work very closely together, so much so that we were communicating almost on a daily basis around uh, portfolio, platforms, and uh, updates around the, the, the benchmarks testing and, and validation efforts. So Melinda, are you happy with these PowerEdge boxes that Seamus is building to, uh, to, house, to house your baby? We are delighted. You know, it's hard to find stronger partners than Seamus and Dell. With AMD's second generation Epic server CPUs, we already had undisputable industry performance leadership. And then with the third and now the fourth generation CPUs, we've just increased our lead with competition. We've got so many outstanding features at the platform at the CPU level. Everybody focuses on the high core counts, but there's also the DDR5, the memory, the IO, and the storage subsystem. So we believe we have a fantastic performance and performance per dollar, performance per watt edge over competition. And we look to partners such as Dell to help us showcase that leadership. Well, so Shane, yeah, through, yeah, go ahead. Ken. What I'd add, Dave, is that through the, the partnership that we've had, you know, we've been able to develop uh, subsystems and platform features that historically we couldn't have. Um, really things around thermals, power efficiency, and, uh, and efficiency within the platform that means that customers can get the most out of their compute infrastructure. So this is going to be a big question moving forward as next generation yeah. platforms are rolled out. Uh, there's the potential for people to have sticker shock. Uh, you talk about something that has eight or 12 cores in a, in a physical enclosure versus 96 cores. And, uh, and uh, I guess the, the question is, do the ROI and TCO numbers look good for someone to uh, make that upgrade? Seamus, you want to you want to hit that first? You guys are interviewing. Absolutely, yeah. Sorry, so absolutely. Yeah. So, we uh, I'll tell you what. At the moment, uh, customers really can't afford not to upgrade at the moment. 
right? Um, we've taken a look at the cost basis of uh, keeping older infrastructure in place. Um, let's say five or seven year old infrastructure servers that are that are uh, drawing more power, uh, maybe are, are poorly utilized within the infrastructure and uh, take more and more effort and time to manage, maintain, and uh, and really keep in production. So as customers look to upgrade or refresh their platforms, what we're finding, right, is that they can take a dynamic consolidation, uh, sometimes five, seven, eight to one consolidation, depending on which platform they have as a historical and uh, which one they're looking to upgrade to. Um, Within AI specifically and machine learning frameworks, we're seeing really unprecedented performance. Um, Malin's team partnered with us to deliver uh, multiple benchmarks uh, for the launch, some of which we're still continuing to see the goodness from, um, things like TPCX AI as a framework. And I'm talking about here sp specifically the CPU-based uh, performance even though in a lot of those AI frameworks, you would also expect to have GPUs, which all of the four platforms that we're offering on the AMD portfolio today offer multiple GPU offerings. So we're seeing a balance between a huge amount of CPU gain and performance, as well as uh, more and more GPU offerings within the platform. That was, real, that was a real challenge for us because of the thermal challenges. I mean, you think, GPUs are going up 300, 400 watt. These CPUs at 96 core are, are quite demanding thermally. But what we're able to do is through some, some unique smart cooling engineering uh, within the, the PowerEdge portfolio, we can uh, take a look at those platforms and make the most efficient use case by having things like telemetry within the platform. So that way we can dynamically change fan speeds to get customers the best performance without throttling based on their need. Melind, the Cube was at the uh, supercomputing conference uh, in Dallas this year, supercomputing conference 2022. And a lot of the discussion was around not only uh, advances in microprocessor technology, but also advances in interconnect technology. How do you manage that sort of research partnership with Dell when you aren't strictly just focusing on the piece that you're bringing to the party. It's kind of a potluck. You know, uh, we, we, we mentioned uh, PCIe Gen 5 or 5.0, whatever you want to call it. Uh, new DDR, um, uh, storage cards, NICs, accelerators, all of those, all of those things. Um, how do you keep that straight when those aren't things that you actually build? Well, excellent question, Dave. And you know, as we are developing the next platform, obviously the, the ongoing relationship is there with Dell, but we start way before launch, right? Sometimes it's multiple years before launch. So we are not just focusing on the super high core counts at the CPU level um, and the platform configurations, whether it's single socket or dual socket. We are looking at it from the memory subsystem, from the IO subsystem. PCI lanes for the storage is a big deal, for example, in this generation. So it's really a holistic approach. And look, core counts are you know, more important at the higher end for some customers, HPC space, some of the AI applications. But on the lower end, you have database applications or some other ISP applications that care a lot about those. So it's, I guess, different things matter to different folks across verticals. So we partner with uh, Dell way early in the cycle. And it's really a joint co-engineering. Seamus talked about the focus on AI with TPC XAI. So we set five world records in that space, just on that one benchmark with AMD and Dell. So fantastic kick, kick off to that across a multitude of scale factors. But TPC XAI is not just the only thing we are focusing on. We are also collaborating with Dell and Desi AI on some of the transformer based natural language processing models that we worked on, for example. So it's not just a steep CPU story, it's CPU platform, memory subsystem software, and the whole thing delivering goodness across the board to solve end user problems in AI and, and other verticals. Yeah, the two of you are at the tip of the spear from a performance perspective. So uh, I know it's easy to get excited about world records and, and they're, they're fantastic. I know Seamus, you know that you know, end user customers might, might 
immediately have the reaction, well, I don't need a Ferrari in my data center, or you know, well, what I need is to be able to do more with less. Um, well, aren't we delivering that also? And you know, you mentioned, uh, uh, Milland, uh, you mentioned uh, natural, natural language processing. Um, Seamus, are you thinking in 2023 that a lot more enterprises are gonna be able to afford to do things like that? I mean, what are you hearing from customers on this front? I mean, while the adoption of the top bin CPU stack is is definitely the exception, not the rule today, um, we are seeing marked performance, even when we look at the mid bin CPU offerings from from AMD. Uh, those are you know the most common sold SKUs, and when we look at customers' implementations, really what we're seeing is the fact that uh, they're trying to make the most not just of dollar spend, but also the whole subsystem that Melind was talking about. You know, the fact that balanced memory configs can give you uh, marked performance improvements, not just at the CPU level, but as actually all the way through to the to the application performance. So it's, it's uh, trying to find the correct balance between the application needs, your budget, power draw, and infrastructure within the, the data center, right? Because not only could you, uh, you could be purchasing and, and look to deploy the most powerful systems, but if you don't have an infrastructure that's that's got the right power, right? That's a large challenge that's happening right now. And the right cooling to deal with the thermal differences of the systems, might you wanna ensure that um, that you can accommodate those for not just today, but in the future, right? So it's, it's Maybe, finding that balance. If I may just add on to that, right? So when we launched, uh, not just the fourth generation, but any generation in the past, there's a natural tendency to zero in on the top bin and say, wow, we've got so many cores. But as Seamus correctly said, it's not just that one core count OPN, it's it's the whole stack. And we believe with our fourth gen CPU processor stack, we've simplified things so much. We don't have you know dozens and dozens of offerings. We have a fairly simple SKU stack, but we also have a very efficient SKU stack. So even, even though at the top end, we've got 96 cores, the thermal budget that we require is fairly reasonable. And look, with all the energy crisis going around, especially in Europe, this is a big deal. Not only do customers want performance, but they are also super focused on performance per watt. And so we believe with this generation, we've really delivered not just on raw performance, but also on performance per dollar and performance per watt. Yeah, and it's not just Europe. I'm we're, we're here in Palo Alto right now, which is in California, where we all know the cost of an individual kilowatt hour <laughs> of electricity, because it's quite because it's quite high. Um, uh, so so thermals, power, cooling, all of that, all of that goes together, and that and that drives cost. So it's a question of how much can you get done per dollar. Seamus, you made the point that you're not you don't just have a one size fits all uh, solution. That it's that it's fit for function. Um, I, I'm I'm curious to hear from you, from the two of you, what your thoughts are from a from a general AI and ML perspective. We're starting to see right now, if you hang out on any kind of social media, um, the rise of these experimental AI uh, programs that are being presented to the public. Uh, some will write stories for you based on prompt. Mm -hmm. Some will create images for you. Uh, one of the more popular ones will create sort of a, your superhero alter ego for, uh, I, I can't wait to do it, I just got the app on my phone. Um, so those are all fun and they're trivial, but they sort of get us used to this idea that, wow, these systems can do things, they can think on their own in a certain way. What do you, what do you see the future of that looking like over the next year in terms of enterprises, what they're going to do for it, with it? Melinda, yeah. I can do it first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, good. So the couple of examples, Dave, that you mentioned are, I guess it's a blend of novelty and curiosity. You know, people using AI to write stories or poems or, you know, even carve out little jokes, check grammar and spelling. Very useful, but still, you know, kind of in the realm of novelty. In the mainstream, in the enterprise, look, uh, in my opinion, AI is not just going to be a vertical. It's going to be a horizontal capability. We are seeing AI deployed across the board once the models have been suitably trained for disparate functions ranging from fraud detection or anomaly detection, 
both in the financial markets, in manufacturing, to things like image classification or object detection that you talked about in, in the sort of a core AI space itself, right? So we don't think of AI necessarily as a vertical, although we are showcasing it with a specific benchmark for launch, but we really look at AI emerging as a horizontal capability. And frankly, companies that don't adopt AI on a massive scale run the risk of being left behind. Yeah, absolutely. There's an AI as an outcome is really something that companies, I think of it in the fact that they're adopting that and the frameworks that you're now seeing as the novelty pieces that Melinda was talking about uh, is, is really indicative of the under the covers activity that's been happening within infrastructures and within enterprises for the past, let's say five, six, seven years, right? Um, the fact that you have object detection within manufacturing to be able to uh, to be able to do defect detection within manufacturing lines. Um, now that can be done on edge platforms all the way at the device. So you're no longer only having to have things be done, you know, in the data center. You can bring it right out to the edge and have that high performance, uh, you know, inferencing training models. Now, not necessarily training at the edge, but the inferencing models especially. So that way you can, you know, have more and uh, and better use cases for some of these these instances. Things like, you know, smart cities with uh, with video detection, so that way they can see. Um, especially during COVID, we saw a lot of hospitals and um, a lot of customers that were using uh, using uh, image and, and spatial detection within their their video feeds to be able to determine who and what employees we're at risk during COVID. So there's a lot of different use cases that have been coming around. I think the novelty aspect of it is really interesting. And I I know my kids, my daughters uh, love that, that portion of it, but really what's been happening has been exciting for quite a, quite a period of time in the enterprise space. We're just now starting to actually see those come to light uh, in more of a, a consumer uh, relevant kind of use case. So the technology that's been developed in the data center around all of these um, different use cases is now starting to feed in because we do have more powerful compute at our fingertips. We do have the ability to talk more about the framework and infrastructure um, that's that's right out at the edge. You know, I know Dave, in the past, you've said things like the data center of, you know, 20 years ago is now in my hand as, as my cell phone. That's and right. uh, and that's that's a fact. And I'm it's exciting to think where it's going to be in the next 10 or 20 years. One terabyte, baby. Yeah. One terabyte. Yeah, it's mind boggling. Exactly. It's mind boggling. Yeah. And it makes me feel old. Uh, yeah, me too. And and that and, and Seamus, that all sounded great. All I want is a picture of me as a superhero, though. So you guys are already way ahead of the curve. You know, with with, with that on that note, Seamus, wrap us up with uh, with a, with kind of a summary of the the highlights of what we just went through in terms of the performance you're seeing out of this latest gen uh, architecture yeah, from AMD. Absolutely. So within the TPC XAI frameworks that Melinda and my team uh, have worked together to do, you know we're seeing unprecedented price performance. So the fact that you can get 220 percent uplift gen on gen. Uh, for some of these benchmarks. And, you know, you can have a five to one consolidation um, means that if you're looking to refresh platforms that are historically legacy, uh, you can get a, a huge amount of benefit, both in uh, reduction in the number of units that you need to deploy and uh, the, the amount of performance that you can get per unit. Um, you know, M Melinda had mentioned earlier around uh, CPU performance and performance per watt, specifically on uh, the two socket 2U platform using the fourth generation AMD Epic, you know, we're seeing a 55% higher CPU performance per watt. That is uh, that, you know, when for people who aren't necessarily looking at these statistics, every generation of servers, that that's that is a huge jump leap forward. That combined with 121% higher spec scores, you know, as a benchmark, 
those are huge. Normally we see, let's say a 40 to 60% performance improvement on the spec benchmarks. We're seeing 121%. So while that's really impressive at the top bin, we're actually seeing, you know, large percentile improvements across the mid bins as well. You know, things in the range of like 70 to 90% performance improvements in those standard bins. So it's a, it's a huge performance improvement, uh, a, a power efficiency, which means customers are able to save uh, energy, space, and time based on, on their deployment size. Thanks for that, Seamus. Uh, sadly, gentlemen, our time has expired. With that, I want to thank both of you. Uh, it's a very interesting conversation. Thanks for, thanks for being with us, both of you. Thanks for joining us here on theCUBE for our coverage of AMD's fourth generation EPIC launch. Additional information, including white papers and benchmarks, plus editorial coverage, can be found on doeshardwarematter.com.